So welcome everybody. Welcome everybody and thank you to attend thank you for attending the University of Maryland School of Public Policy Juneteenth celebration. My name is Oluwa Tony Elaugadado and I will be serving as your MC for today. First I would like to thank the Malcolm X performers and drummers for their wonderful live experience. <laughs> Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Ronald Ziegler, a professor here at the University of Maryland and director of the New Baru Student Center. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to this great celebration. Today's program is undoubtedly a celebration, not just a jubilee performance, but a social justice activity endeavor sponsored by the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland under the leadership of a great individual in Ms. Aisha Washington who had the vision to have this program this afternoon <coughs> to make the University of Maryland campus more aware of Juneteenth and its significance in history. This event was featured some great individuals. I'd like to say, uh, just before saying a little bit about Juneteenth, uh, I don't want to take away from Professor Bonner. Uh, it's his show as far as the history. But these African drummers and dancers, uh, in the class I teach jazz, we talk about the importance and the significance of the drum how the masters try to silence the drummers, try to keep down the message. But a good friend of mine uh, who I grew up with, uh, who's a master drummer, uh, early in my life, 
I was more of an athlete than a musician, but I gravitated towards music because the power of the drum, the djembe drum, the talking drum, if you listen to those drums, those drums have meaning. They have a message. The message is that we are celebrating Juneteenth, a day of celebration. Not just a day, but a time of celebration. At one time in history, we could not celebrate. It took two and a half years after slavery officially ended for that celebration to occur. And for some individuals, there still was no celebration because the oppression was still there. But today, we're going to honor those memories. We're not going to talk about, or maybe we will, the black codes, the racism that exists. We're going to talk about the, the positive, but the reality of it as well. I'm sure Professor Bond is going to break it down for us. So I'd like to, again, thank Ms. Washington for contacting Ms. Carswell to involve in the Borough Cultural Center. Uh, we are having our 50th anniversary. I hope all of you who are here today, thank you. October 23rd, put that on your calendars as a day in which we will commemorate the Nibiru Cultural Center at the University of Maryland because Nibiru has been so integral in the lives of so many students, faculty, and staff at the University of Maryland campus. So you have your programs and you know who will be performing today, who will be speaking. We have our drummers and dancers who've already opened up the door and really welcomed us here this afternoon. At this time, I'd like to uh, <coughs> pay tribute to Mayor Patrick Wohan, uh, who will be speaking to you. Uh, so Patrick ran for mayor in 2015 after serving an eight-year term on the city council in order to help College Park realize its unfulfilled promise of becoming a top-tier college town. So again, thank you for attending today's program, and let's accept and welcome our mayor of College Park, Patrick Wohan. <laughs> Dr. Ziegler, it's a real pleasure to be here today, and, and I just, uh, I don't know how, how much I have to say because the, the, the drums just say it all, right? I mean, we, that was such a, a treat and such a, a pleasure to be able to hear that this morning, uh, and really to capture that, that joy, that, that, that experience, that rhythm, that feeling that really, really crosses uh, all cultures, col crosses all races and ethnicities. You can just really feel that, that joy and that celebration, so thank you. Uh, for that experience this morning. Uh, I also want to congratulate the New Morrow, um, uh Cultural Center on the 50th anniversary. Um, a great part, great to have that here in College Park. It's an important part of the fabric of our city. Um, uh, and um, uh, really, uh, I've been a, uh, pr privileged to attend many events at New Morrow over the years. Uh, so we're, we're really lucky to have, uh, to have you here in College Park. Uh, I want to start by reading uh, last night at our city council meeting, we uh, issued a proclamation uh, recognizing, commemorating the, the, and then celebrating the holiday of Juneteenth. Uh, there's a couple of things that I wanted to highlight in particular that we stated in that resolution. I don't want to go, we, we talked a little bit of the history of it and I know we're going to hear more about that in a bit, so I don't want to, I'm going too much into that. But one thing I wanted to note uh, first is that uh, we proclaim that the city of College Park recognizes the importance of Juneteenth we take the occasion to celebrate the emancipation of African Americans uh, from slavery in the United States. Um, but also, we wanted to, with this proclamation, acknowledge the, the lasting shameful legacy of slavery uh, and call upon residents uh, of College Park uh, and all Americans to continue to work to eliminate the disparities of wealth, safety, and quality of life and for that persist and continue to impact Amer African Americans in College Park and around the country. And I think it's important as we celebrate uh, the end of slavery and we celebrate that significant milestone in the long uh, path uh, to the long road to emancipation, 
uh, also for us to reflect upon how far we still have to go and how much work we still have to do uh, in the city of College Park and around the country uh, to, to eliminate those disparities. Uh, in College Park, we are starting that pro progress. We're, we're, we're working to address uh, this last year, we took an important step in recognizing the, the legacy of urban renewal and the Lakeland community, our historic African-American community in College Park, to work to address the disparities that, that still exist and the, 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 uh, the uh, impact that urban renewal uh, had and the displacement in the African-American community that really uh, displaced about two-thirds uh, of that Lakeland, that historic uh, uh, black community here in College Park. Uh, we, are, are be, we have begun and are continuing this long process of restorative justice, uh, exploring the ways that we can, to the, ex to, to the greatest extent possible, make the Lakeland community whole uh, and address that, that, that harmful legacy. Uh, in, in addition to that, we, we face so many, so many continued disparities uh, in College Park, the, the disparities in health outcomes, the disparities in wealth, uh, that we, as a, we're, a, we're a, a small piece of, of the solution here in College Park, but we must do what we can to, to try to address that legacy. Uh, so I, I appreciate you inviting me here to, to, uh, to talk this morning. Uh, I, I do know we have more uh, celebration to come, and I'm looking forward to hearing that and, and also hearing our other speakers this morning. Um, but but, uh, but uh, I, I uh, wanted to read that proclamation and, and, and uh, let you know that, that um, I, uh, as a, uh, speaking on behalf of the City of College Park, we are uh, looking forward to continuing our work with the University of Maryland community. Uh, to, to address uh, uh, the legacy of, of slavery, to work to, to address the disparities that, that, that I mentioned before. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Rohan, for your wise words. Next, I would like to introduce recent graduate of the University of Maryland, co-founder of Black Terrace Matter, and our poet for today's events, Saba Tishabata. Hi, everyone. Hello. My name is Saba Shabaka. I am a recent graduate of the University of Maryland. Thank you. <laughs> um, I just, yeah, I just graduated last month. My major was philosophy, politics, and economics, and I'm really happy to be here today on behalf of the organization that I started last year, this month, called Black Terps Matter. It's an anti-racist coalition that we started out of the unrest that happened. Um, and as probably one of the youngest people in the room today, I really like to uh, share something about something that most of the people my age did last year around this time, which was, um, share a black box on their Instagram. And so one year ago today, 28 million accounts on Instagram posted a black square. Since then, less than 1% of corporate America's pledges from June 2020 have been given. All over the country, laws are popping up to restrict t teaching about systemic racism in schools, specifically in Georgia. Support from white people for BLM is at an all-time low Police brutality towards protesters has increased. Black people continue to be killed by the police at higher rates than white people, as well as many other um, facts and statistics that are very sad. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to make sure to point that out because our work is continuous, not just me as an activist, but all of us as community members. And so Black Terps Matter, uh, we were founded on June 25th, 2020, right here on the campus of the University of Maryland. We had a protest that actually started at Nambru Cultural Center, and we marched to the administration building, as it was then known as the main administration building. It has now been renamed the Mike Miller Administration Building, which we are not okay with. And one of the things that we did as a coalition is write a formal letter to the administration saying that we'd like the building unnamed, which is for many reasons, and um, y'all can contact me or contact Black Terps Matter if you'd like any more information about that. But um, to this day, that name still stands. And that's something that happens while we're here fighting, um, which is sad. So now I wanna go into the poem, which is called A Crime, and I'm actually reciting it. It was written by my friend, 
whose name is Jamie Turner, a phenomenal activist also in the DMV area. So she says, she wrote this because of the continuous issue of police brutality against black people. The brutality is due to the color of their skin because most of the incidents were just a result of racial profiling. My name is on the news. My face is on the newspapers, in magazines, as if I was a martyr. People talk about me as if I sacrificed my life, but I was just trying to live. Some say I shouldn't have resisted. I shouldn't have been out late. Others say that the officers shouldn't have shot 30 warning shots into my back. My cold body lay there as my mother weeps. My father holds her. All I can see is a light and the tracing of my body. Why did this happen to me? What's going to happen to me? I didn't know I was dead till I realized I was watching my own funeral. All because of the color of my skin. My life is of less value than an animal. The white officer looked me in my eyes, smiled, and pulled the trigger. The difference between him and I is he gets to walk on the earth that I once lived. And I, well, I'm in the sky, watching him lie. He was violent, he was a thug, but I know the truth. I am none of those things. I was just a black kid at the wrong place and the wrong time. But I guess that is a crime. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you, Saba, for the wonderful words and for sharing your friend's poem. Next, I would like to introduce the University of Maryland School President Dr. Darrell Pines as he talks to us via video on the significance of Juneteenth and importance this, of this celebration has on our campus today. Hello, my name is Darrell Pines. As president of the University of Maryland, and as a father, husband, and son, I am proud to honor the tradition of celebrating Juneteenth. Each year, June 19th, or Juneteenth, is a day of celebration and reflection commemorating the end of slavery in the United States. Two and a half years after President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. I applaud the University System of Maryland for designating Juneteenth as a holiday across all system institutions. This designation is an important part of our anti-racist agenda and to forge a multicultural community dedicated to mutual respect and inclusion. I encourage you to spend time on Juneteenth to reflect on both our history and recent events and how we can continue to work to eradicate anti-Black racism and racism in all forms together on what many consider America's second independence day. Thank you for your contributions to our university and together we are Terrapin Strong. Hello, my name is, is Daryl Pines. As president of the University of Maryland and as a father, husband, and son, Thank you, Dr. Pines, for the inspirational words. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Christopher Bonner. Dr. Bonner specializes in African-American history as well as 19th century history. Dr. Bonner recently released his first publication, Remarking the Republic, Black Politics and the Creation of American Citizenship. Mr. Bonner, everyone. <laughs> out of class. Um, so <laughs> good morning, uh, folks. Uh, thank you first to Aisha Washington for putting this together and for inviting me. I feel really fortunate to be here. Um, I'll go ahead and get into it. We've, we've already heard the preface that I'll give you all some history. In 1892, Reverend D.A. Scott sent a message to black Baptist congregations across Texas recommending a program 
for Juneteenth celebrations that year. June 19th fell on a Sunday, and Scott and his colleagues wanted to combine religious observances with a broader community gathering. The day would begin with a sunrise prayer service and Sunday school. Afterward, in a moment of reunion, survivors of slavery would share their memories and compare bondage with freedom. People would gather for an early afternoon meal, and then a preacher would deliver a message based on a suggested scripture. It came from John chapter 8, verse 36. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. The planners left substantial room for both education and celebration. Let's have a good old-fashioned shout, they said, and give thanks to God for our freedom all day long. So today, I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes, and I'd like to say a bit about how Juneteenth came to exist as a distinctive occasion to celebrate, like why this date. I'll talk about how African Americans commemorated the day, and finally, I'll offer some thoughts about what Juneteenth meant for black Texans and what it might mean for us. Celebrating Juneteenth was an opportunity to revel in freedom, and it was a political act. African Americans used the past to make arguments about the present in pursuit of a different future. One thing we can learn from Juneteenth uh, is that emancipation was a complicated and uneven process. There was no individual document and no single moment that ended slavery. From the beginning of the Civil War, enslaved people tried to free themselves. In Virginia, for instance, they started run away, running away from their owners in the spring of 1861 when rebel guns were firing on Fort Sumter. Enslaved people took the dangerous first steps to secure their freedom, but they recognized that their steps might be few and their paths might be short without protection from slave owners. So across the South, black Americans ran in search of the US military, hoping soldiers would help secure their freedom. The US government's emancipation policies developed gradually, and always their policies developed in response to black people seeking their own freedom. Union officers realized that harboring runaways would deprive rebels of valuable captive workers, and so officers started sheltering enslaved people in May 1861. Congress made that policy into law, and then Abraham Lincoln affirmed it when he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which took effect January 1st, 1863. That document transformed the Civil War. It made emancipation a central goal of the US military. But it had crucial limitations. And most important among those limitations was that the Emancipation Proclamation required enslaved people to find their own way to the military in order to secure the freedom that Lincoln had promised. Because there were so few US soldiers in Texas during the war, few enslaved people were able, few enslaved people in that state were able to reap the benefits of emancipation policies. But this changed on June 19, 1865, when Union troops arrived in Galveston and Major General Gordon Granger announced that they would enforce Lincoln's proclamation. So sometimes this moment, June 19, 1865, this moment gets framed as the moment when enslaved Texans first learned about the Emancipation Proclamation. But Juneteenth was really just the first real opportunity for enslaved people in Texas to actually secure their freedom. Texas newspapers were covering the Emancipation Proclamation throughout 1863. White Texans were talking about emancipation, and as we know from the history of slavery, when white folks talked about something, enslaved people knew about it. But slave owners used laws and they used violence to keep African Americans in bondage. Rebel Southerners actually saw Texas as a refuge during the war. When the Union Army moved into territory in the Deep South in states like Mississippi and Louisiana, slave owners actually fled those places and went to Texas. And their hope was that they would be able to escape the Union Army and its emancipating grasp. So when we think about it in this light, we can see part of why Juneteenth was so significant to so many African Americans. Some of the people who were liberated in Texas were only there because they had already been removed from places, other places in the South where freedom had been so close. Emancipation arrived in Texas on June 19, 1865, because enslaved people struggled to find allies and because rebel Southerners worked and schemed to preserve slavery. 
And so uh, one little aside here is that I think this history of emancipation points to part of why we're commemorating Juneteenth here in Maryland, right, a, a Texas event in Maryland. Emancipation was a scattered process, uh, but June 19th offers us one particular moment when we know a lot of black folks were able to get free. So it's a, it's a, a, a memorable moment uh, that we can uh, look back on. African Americans celebrated Juneteenth as soon as they could in June 1866. Reverend Scott's suggested program from the 1890s gives us a sense of how these days typically looked. Religious or political leaders delivered public speeches reflecting on the history and significance of the day. Often people would read the Emancipation Proclamation. They were remembering this moment when the federal government had finally decided to challenge slavery. These were communal events. People would travel within Texas. They would go to places, historic sites like Galveston and major cities like Houston and Dallas. Their celebrations were also making arguments, forceful arguments about the meaning of freedom and the problem of inequality. Juneteenth often involved parades through towns and cities. And by forming these large visible crowds, black people insisted that they should enjoy access to public space on the same terms as white Texans. This was especially significant in the late 19th century as lawmakers were crafting the exclusionary policies of Jim Crow. And also while this is happening in the late 19th century, white Southerners were developing a mythology about the Confederacy, describing the rebellion as noble or heroic. Juneteenth told the truth that the Civil War was a fight over slavery and it served as a kind of counter-programming to the lost cause. To me, one of the most compelling aspects of Juneteenth is the big afternoon meal. You might be able to tell uh, if you look closely. One man remembered the smells that greeted him on Juneteenth mornings. Roast beef, spare ribs, fried chicken, collard greens, turnip greens, mustard greens, pork chops, black eyed peas, the list went on. The abundance of the meal was an important part of this event. One woman recalled that on Juneteenth, you got all you want to eat. Slavery had been characterized by daily deprivation of liberty, safety, leisure, and food. For survivors of slavery and their descendants, a Juneteenth feast was an opportunity to display and to experience the difference between present lives and past enslavement. They felt freedom in their full bellies. So this is part of what Juneteenth meant to African Americans. It was a chance to revel in freedom, to experience community and abundance in ways that were highly restricted under slavery. Juneteenth celebrated black life. And this was meaningful precisely because Americans continued their efforts to confine and eradicate it. The 14th and 15th Amendments declared that African Americans would have equal protection of the laws and that black men would have the right to vote. But these measures had little practical effect after the 1870s. White Southerners reclaimed power through legal exclusion and a reign of terror. White men brutalized black people who pursued politics, owned land, educated themselves, or simply tried to live together in freedom. And the possibilities of reconstruction collapsed when the federal government withdrew from the South and left African Americans to defend themselves and their rights. Black folks recognized that forgetting the histories of slavery and emancipation was part of their brutal marginalization. On Juneteenth, they urged others to remember. Celebrating Texas emancipation invoked the history of a government that served people in need. Each year, black Texans called on those in power to remember the tremendous change that was possible when a government responded to vulnerable people's concerns. And they also talked about their own work, building community institutions like churches and schools. Black people had seized the opportunities of freedom, and any policies or actions that restricted those opportunities were fundamentally unjust. So Juneteenth was criticizing white terror in the South, and it was also criticizing the US government's neglect of black Southerners. As I close, I want to turn back to that suggested scripture for Juneteenth in 1892. 
If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I don't know the contents of the sermons that would have been preached that day, but there's something significant about the phrase free indeed. Actually free. Undeniably free. To me, this seems like a striking contrast to free in law, as African Americans were. When a preacher read that verse, they announced that black Texans expected to be free indeed, and that they would insist on enjoying that position. We can read their definitions of freedom in the Juneteenth celebrations. Freedom was more than just liberty. Freedom was more than just unfettered choice, the ability to do whatever you wanted, regardless of consequences. African Americans wanted to enjoy comfort and community and opportunity, and they wanted to be seen and heard by a government that would support their needs and secure their rights. As we reflect on this Emancipation Day, we should think about what it means to us to be free indeed. We should recognize that police killed more than 60 people during the trial of Derek Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd. More than half of those people were black or Latino. We should note that black women are three times more likely than white women to die in childbirth. That 69% of white students graduate college within six years compared with only 51% of black students. That African Americans account for only 6% of the faculty here at the University of Maryland. And black students were 10% of the most recent freshman class in a state where they comprise 34% of high school graduates. In 1892, black people took Juneteenth as an opportunity to enjoy their freedom, to reflect on its limitations, and to do work designed to secure it and enrich it. We would do well to follow their example. Thank you. Thank you. That was uh, wonderful. Uh, this has been a great celebration. Um, I just wanted to say thank you on behalf of the School of Public Policy for joining us in what I hope to be our first annual Juneteenth celebration. I want to thank Aisha and actually the entire Office of Executive Program staff because I know you all have been working hard to make this happen. Um, I really appreciate that and thank you for joining us. Uh, I just came back last Friday from a family trip to Alabama, which is where my people migrated from. And whenever I'm down there, I take a recorder and I ask all kinds of questions of my family. I know my aunt's tired of me, but she's like 94, and I'm trying to get all the information I can, so I recorded her. And part of what I learned in this last trip is that my great-grandmother's, whose name is Bessie Stallworth, her mother was born in 1859 into slavery in Alabama. And that's very powerful because that's not that long ago. You know, these are people that I can look at pictures of and reach out and touch, you know, very familiar to me. Um, I think about the fact that my mother grew up in Alabama picking cotton. You know, so the history that Professor Bonner was sharing lets me know that we are not that far away from this freedom. Um, they say freedom isn't always free. There's still some prices that we're paying. Saba, thank you for sharing the words and for your organization starting last year, it's a good reminder that we still have work to do. We've come a long way, we're celebrating and we still have work to do. Um, I teach a class in social identity in the School of Public Policy and um, just looked at our course evaluations and one kid wrote in this past semester at 70 students in the class, stop teaching critical race theory. It's like, no, I'm not going to. But hearing the history, hearing the rhythm and the beat that's connecting me beyond Juneteenth, it's connecting me to Africa. So I thank you for that because that matters too. We don't just stop. Our history isn't just about our experiences in the United States of America. We have to remain connected to our history beyond these borders. So I thank you for the drum that I can still feel in my heart that is connecting me to the rhythm and the dancing um, connected me to the rhythm and the spirit of my ancestors because that really means a lot. So again, I'm saying it very publicly, I hope we do this every year. 
And I hope we fill the room and we keep telling the story and we keep hearing the history because we cannot forget. So thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate it. Akiwawa, conductor of the train. Akiwawa, conductor of the train. Please take me home to my father's house. Akiwawa, conductor of the train. Akiwawa, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 